It's good to see everybody tonight. I'm John McDowell. Uh, can't remember that. Just remember midnight. That's, most people know that more than my real name. Uh, good to see a good turnout tonight. Uh, I know most of you folks, um, but it's sure nice to see the new folks at all. I fish with a whole lot of people here. I see at least eight or nine that I've gone offshore fishing with or gone with me. So tonight we're going to talk about wahoo fishing. Uh, and I'm going to try to go over some stuff that I've picked up over the last 45 years of fishing for Wahoo off the North Carolina coast. Does that mean it's the best way or the only way? No. That's just what I feel comfortable with, I have some confidence in. And I kind of feel like anything else, if you've got confidence in what you're doing, you're going to do a little bit better. So, uh, take it for what it's worth. Uh, let's keep this an open thing. If you have any questions, you know, fire them at me. Any suggestions, you agree, disagree, uh, I'm open for uh, suggestions. Okay? Let me, let me see a show of hands. How many people here routinely offshore fish? You have Gulf Stream type fish. Okay. How many, how many want to? Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, we're kind of blessed here in North Carolina. Uh, Riceville Beach actually is well known nationwide for a great fall wahoo fishery. Uh, there's some nice large sized fish caught in North Carolina in the fall. Uh, fall's not the only time they're here, but uh, it's, it's just a great time right now. It's just a shame we've had this wind for the last, seems like a month where there's not very many fishing days. But uh, it's an excellent time this time of year to get out there and get after them. It's a great time to get a citation fish. It's just a super time. And now is when you're going to go get into the 80, 90, 90 pound fish. Uh, your best chance of getting them. Okay, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about tackle. Uh, this is just what I use, what I feel comfortable with. Um, I guess if you looked at everybody that fished a stream, I probably lean towards fishing the lighter side of tackle than some of the other boats that I see out there. My standard trolling rod is either one of two things. Uh, I like pin, you know, nothing wrong with Shimano um, or some of the others, uh, but I, I've used pin all my life and I'm just comfortable with it. One thing I like about them, they're easy to work on, uh, clean, put drag washers in or whatever. I use uh, a pin 30 wide on a 30 to 80 pound class rod for my standard trolling rod and I'll run probably four of those, five, and then one pin 50 wide and I run that on a uh, 50 to 130 pound class rod. That's what this one is right here. And the only reason I run a larger reel like this is this is my shotgun line. This is the one that's way back there. So I want a whole lot of line on it. So when something hits it, I've got, he makes a big run. I've still got a lot to work with here. So this one goes way, way back. All the rest of them are 30s. On 30s, I use um, 60 pound test Momoi diamond uh, line and uh, you know nothing against some of the others but I like Momoi I've tried them all I've used every one out there Momoi the breaking strength is something like 20 percent 18 20 percent somewhere in that neighborhood higher than what it's rated so it's a strong line and the diameter is a lot smaller than some of the others so you can get a lot more on your reel for example, on a 30 wide, I can get 495 yards <coughs> of 60 pound test line on a 30 wide. And there ain't no wahoo around here that's going to spool that if uh, somebody on the reel knows what they're doing. So uh, that works real good. And then also that line doesn't have a whole a lot, awful lot of memory to it. And when I say memory, when it's coiled up, it doesn't remember that. It'll straighten back out. And uh, that's just, Memoirs work real good for me. Uh, on this 50, uh, this is 80 pound test, Mamoy. 
And then also 80 pound test. Uh, I think this is Bill Fisher leader. There's several of them out there. They're all they're all good. Just mono leader. I don't use fluorocarbon. Uh, it's good. You want to spend the money for it? Fine. It works great. But I don't really see the need for it. I think it's a little overkill. Um, so that's pretty much my standard tackle. I set uh, for my trolling rods, like this one here, I set the drag when I'm trolling at about 15 pounds. Now I've done it for so long that uh, I can just sit right here and mess with this a little bit and I can get it to where I'm, I'm about within a pound of it, just pulling on it. I'll be within a pound, 15 pounds. And that's pretty close to it right there. Wayne, grab these scales right here. And you'll be surprised what 15 pounds doesn't sound like a lot. But well, I'm going to show you what it's like. And when you're when you're wanting to measure your drag, if you want to if you want to set your reels with a scale like we're doing right here, do it out there. Don't do it here. You want your drag out there at the end of the rod, not not here at the reel. I'm gonna pull back. What was that? Twenty. All right. About nineteen. All right. <clears throat> Seventeen. Okay. This will be right on it. Do it one more time. <laughs> About 16. Yeah. That's a lot of pull in it. Anybody want to feel that? What 15 pound feels like? Yeah. You know, 15 pounds doesn't sound like a lot, but... You might want to hold the handle. Hold, hold the handle. handle. <laughs> John, in the face. John, put your hand Get your good hand and hold on it. I don't want to take that light out. <laughs> All right, much in it. Okay. So I'll set it at. Uh, I'll set them all about 15 pounds. Uh, you know, there's a lot of formulas. I've heard stuff like, okay, 30% of the breaking strength of the line and all that, but. What I'm kind of thinking about is uh, what's going to set that hook good in that fish. And 15 pounds, and I'll, I'll talk about this later. I'm a big believer in sharp, sharp hooks. Big believer. But 15 pounds of drag and me going seven knots, I'll drive a rusty 16-penny nail through a Wahoo's jaw if he hits it at that, at that pound. Okay, so that's my trolling rods, uh, 30 wides and 50 wides, 60-pound uh, test line, 60-pound leader, 80-pound line, 80-pound leader, and I don't use wind-on swivels, I don't use holocore, I, I just connect my leader to my line using a blood knot. Everybody familiar with that knot, how to tie one? Nice thing about it is it's a strong knot, it holds good, it doesn't lose much of the breaking strength, and it makes a very small, it's tied right, it makes a very small knot that'll go through the guys very well. So, so John, in other words, that's a leader that you've got on there, that's not your line that's on the spool? That's a piece of leader material that's on there? That's a piece of leader material tied directly to that and how And how thick is that leader material? What's, what, what pound? The what diameter pound test? of it? Oh, what pound test? The same as a line. Why do you use that at all then? Hmm? Why do you use Color. that if it's the same as a line? Color. Color? Because mm -hmm. you think that clear line makes a difference? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. At one time I probably knew uh, blood line, blood knot, but I, I don't know it right now. Would you mind showing? Yeah, we get done. I, I brought a spool of line right here in case yeah. anybody wanted to see a specific knot. Uh, I'd be glad to show it to you. Uh, and when we're talking about knots, you know, I probably can tie 25 different knots, but on a routine basis, I probably use four. And I think it's a whole lot better to know four knots and know how to tie them very, very well and be able to tie them under you know, rocky conditions out on the ocean than just say I know 30 knots. You know. 
not be able to get them tied exactly right. So, yeah, I'll be happy to. And then also, uh, I connect a swivel. I don't crimp. You know, a lot of people say when you get up into this size line, you need to use crimps. I don't. I tie a uni knot. Just a plain old uni knot. Just tie my swivel on right here. Never had one fail. Never have had one fail. So that's just, that's pretty plain Jane, standard. Uh, nothing magical about it. But it works. Uh, and, uh, What's your rod length? Hmm? What's your rod length? This is here is a uh, five and a six foot rod. Is that what you always pretty much stay with, or do you get that, that's a little bit shorter over there, isn't it? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you about this rod coming up. Uh, this one is shorter. Uh, yeah, yeah, most of mine are about six foot rods. I've got a couple of six and a half, pretty much that. And I also have a, a couple of TLD 25s that I've got rigged up. I don't know, probably 50 pound test line on, and I'll use those occasionally. Pretty much stay with that same setup right there. And we talked about the drag there at 15. When a fish hits that, I don't rush over there and jam that drag down. I, uh, pretty much leave it at that and just see what that fish is going to do for a while before I make any decisions on backing off of it or tightening it up on it or anything like that. But, you know, if you keep the boat going and you got 15 pounds of drag and a wahoo hits it, you got a good pull on that fish right there. Okay? The other thing, John, you <laughs> might want to mention is, is the diameter of that spool gets smaller, the drag goes up. Very good point. <clears throat> Very good point. You start looking at the spool, or you got a nice wahoo on there making a big run. He's taking 175 yards of line off of that reel. You look at that reel, oh my God, it's getting smaller, 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 smaller. And the tendency is to tighten up on that thing. Well, that 15 pounds of drag, after he's taken out 150 yards of line, all of a sudden now is more like 22 pounds of drag that you've got on that fish. Because think about it, the spool is smaller. It's got to spin more and more times around to get the same amount of line off. So drag, the drag does get drag get heavier. Drag washes up too. Drag washers are getting hot too, which is going to make it put more heat on it, more drag. Yep. Exactly. Good point. I'm glad you remind. I meant, I meant to say something about that. I'm glad you. You're good for something, Tom. Stick with me, kid. <laughs> Stick with me. I'll teach you the ropes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is a little different, but uh, you wouldn't know by looking at it. But that's my planer rod. You notice anything different about it? Short butt. Uh, yeah, it's not a bent butt rod. The only reason I can get away with it on my boat, if you look at the at the gunnels as it gets back to the back, they slope down. It's what they call that Euro transom. It slopes back, and my back rod holders are at about a 30 degree angle. So when I put this in the back rod holder, it's about like that right there. If I put a bent butt in there, it's, it's, it's down like that. Now, if my gunnels if my back rod holders that I would run a planer rod on were like that, then I'd have to have a, a bent butt rod. I used one for a long time, but I had to keep it chained in so dang hard. I, I actually had it snatched out of the boat a couple of times. But this works real good. This, uh, this rod here has got 350 yards, not feet, 350 yards of 150 pound braid on it. I use Power Pro just because I've used it forever and feel very comfortable with it. I'm sure there's some others good. And then uh, on top of that, 100 pound, 130 pound leader material. And, you know, I use a, a bridle system. There's a lot of them out there. You can go out there and spend $50 for some fancy, rigged up on somewhere. And there's nothing wrong with them at all. Everybody know what I mean about a bridle rig on a planter? Okay. Let me back up a little bit. You got your planter here, okay? And 
to say you're Spanish mackerel fishing, you know, we're all accustomed to pulling planters with cork spoons behind uh, planters. You got your planter coming through the water here, your water, your line back to your cork spoon, 20, 30 feet back there. Hits it, he trips it, you know, going through the water like that, it trips, comes to the top, through it to here, hand line in that, uh, in that little Spanish mackerel or whatever. Well, actually, that's what that is right there. That's, that's an inline planter where you have to hand line it in there. You start getting into some of these bigger fish, it's, uh, it's much more convenient if you don't have to do that. I mean, you can do it. Uh, this, it's a lot more convenient if you'll rig a bridle, and it's very easy to do. It sounds complex, but it's easy. What I do, I just take a planer, crimp on a piece of about 150, 200 pound mono to a little old brass clip you can get at Home Depot for a couple bucks on either side. Then, I'm going to need somebody's help here. Go ahead and pull some line off of this thing. I'll tell you when to slow down. Now I've got about 60 pounds of, excuse me, 60 feet a liter on this. Alright, there we go. That's good. Top one's right in the rod. Still in the rod. Alright. Okay. What I've got here is my braid. 350 yards of braid on here. Of course, that's enough for anything. I mean, that's, I, I, I don't need anywhere near, near that much on there. But this stuff lasts so much longer than mono. If I put that much on there, every year I can cut 50 yards off of it. Kind of have fresh line out there. And then I attach that. <clears throat> Next thing I do, tie a bimini, bimini <coughs> twist knot, which is just a, a, a nice loop knot, big loop knot in my braid. And then tie, it's kind of, I don't know the exact name for this knot. It, I call it a grouper knot because it's exactly the same knot I use to attach leader to braid for grouper fishing. Uh, it's kind of like a modified Albright knot where you twist the uh, mono, go through it, wrap it up seven or eight times, and then wrap back seven or eight times, and then go through it in a couple half hitches there. That, that will not break. And it makes a nice, smooth, small uh, knot that'll go through the guides real well. Not like a PR knot you talking about? And then uh, you've got a... Uh, this is just a triple overhand loop knot right here. And then you come up a little bit and you got another triple overhand knot. So when I get ready to fish, I'll hook something, you know, Islander or Sea Witch or something on the end of that, bait it up, connect one clip through that loop. Another through here. Set it out, and that's coming through the water just like that right there. <clears throat> that's bringing that down. This size planter here, depending on how much line I've got out, I'm getting it down maybe 50 feet, 45, 50 feet, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe a little further. Fish hits it, comes like that, and that planter's coming to the top. And the angler fights it to the, fights it to the rod, now, if you had an in line when he got it to the rod, well, what do you got to do? I got 60 feet of this stuff here I've got to pull in by hand. And, uh, you know, which you could do. But now what I do is the angler reels it up to here, and you just come here, just unclip this thing. And now, those knots will go right through these guys. <laughs> and I can fight the fish all the way to the boat and nobody's having to uh, leader him in. And like I say, there's others out there that you can do with uh, wind-on crimp or wind-on uh, swivels and crimps and all that. And nothing, nothing in the world wrong with them. It's just I kind of like to keep things simple. and That would be very, if I had a malfunction, that would be very easy to tie or to retie 
while it's out on the ocean. Not something you have to do at home. Nothing I like about these pins, they're loud. Sounds great when the fish is running. Hmm? Sounds great when the fish is running. Yep. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Hadn't heard that sound in a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions about any of this? Could you use a downrigger? Excuse me? Could you use a downrigger instead of Yes, a sir, you sure can. Uh, in fact, I've done it. I've caught wahoo, sailfish, tuna, you name it, using downriggers. I don't use downriggers now. Uh, I've gone pretty much exclusively to planters. The problem, the problem with downriggers, you know, for king mackerel, where you're like live bait fishing for king mackerel or so, you're going a mile and a half an hour or something like that. Downriggers are great. Wahoo fishing, you're typically trolling between six and nine knots and you know you got an 8, 10, 12 pound ball back there yeah. that thing's going to blow back yeah. so instead of it being you know the meter on your downrigger or your uh, yeah your downrigger says that it's down 120 feet well it's probably more at a 45 angle 45 degree angle where it's only down like 60 feet and it'll work it'll work um, and another thing too, I hear this all the time. You've got to have braid on a on a downrigger. You can't use cable or braided braided wire. That humming sound, and it makes a humming sound. They say, "Oh, it scares fish." No, it doesn't. It attracts fish. It attracts fish. I've heard that so many times, and I know it's nonsense. I've tested it over and over and over again. That sound. Uh, you think a fish is smart enough to say, oh, there's a humming, oh, there's a wire coming by here, I better get out of here. No, I had to bull. It will attract fish. In fact, your boat is the best teaser you've got in the world. You talk about dredges and daisy chains and all that sort of stuff, your boat's the best teaser. You run over a school of black fin, you mark them at 120 feet, run over them six times, see if you don't start seeing them up there around 30 feet. They're coming up to investigate. I'm curious because they're looking for food. They hear that humming sound. Now, with downrigger, a little trick that I want to tell you about, and I've caught some real nice wahoo doing this. <coughs> if you're using downriggers, and say you're going about six knots or so, and you mark wahoo at, I don't know, pick a number. Say you're at 300 feet of water, and you mark them down there at 100 feet. Uh, or you mark a big school of bait that you think some wahoo are going to be around. Run back over it. Mark it, hit your MOB or whatever so you can find it again. Run back over it. And when you get right on top of it, cut your engine. Throw it in neutral. And what's going to happen to that downrigger here? It's going to come down like that. And what that wahoo is going to think, because it's going to drag that bait down behind it, okay, there's an injured bait. And a wahoo is a predator fish. And just like a wolf or any other kind of predator, they're going to go after the weakest link. He sees that thing falling, chances are he's going to hammer it. And with planers, top rods, downriggers like you're talking about, try to keep your baits above the fish. So if the, you think the fish are holding it 60 feet, keep those baits above 60 feet if you can. Because look where their eyes are. Top part of the head. And if a, if a fish is down... 70 feet, and your troll, you go over him, and you got a line back there 150 feet behind your boat, and say a little chugger or something, he'll hear that. He's picking it up on those lateral lines. And it's nothing for him to come up 70 feet for bait. You've seen them, everybody's seen them sky before. You've seen King Michael sky, you've seen Wahoo sky. That's what they're doing. They were down there, and they hear that. They're coming up like a missile like that. So, yeah, downriggers will work. I just prefer planers because I can keep them down deeper at a faster speed. So John, you don't like And then I don't like that thing in the, you know, with a downrigger, i got to crank it up every time. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't like doing that. John, you don't yeah, use man. trolling weights? Huh? Trolling weights, lead trolling weights, yeah. you don't use them? Absolutely. And right here, just for you, Tom, set up the same way with the same little Home Depot clips 
and that will fit on that same bridle rig. You want to make sure on your length, uh, you know, when you crimp this stuff together, you want the length to be the, all the same, depending on how far your little loops are on that bridle, because you get them, you get them too close together, you can't set that planer. That planer will go down. You get them too far apart, when you're fighting a fish, you're pulling the two loops, not the main line. So yeah, I'll use uh, I'll use trolling weights for will. And I don't personally uh, do much of this high speed trolling. Uh, I know you can catch fish doing it. I know a lot of people are successful at it. I think though, day in and day out, you're going to catch more fish. Um, Find an area that's holding them and working it hard. Just working it hard. And my preference, like I said, six, seven, eight knots, somewhere right in there, typically what I do. And, and that varies from day to day. If you're not doing anything at six, bump it up to seven or eight, and even maybe down to five, something like that. Uh, what you got to think about, too, when you're, we'll be, we'll, any more questions about tackle? We, we, we got that. I mean, that's. Pretty basic stuff. John, yes. I got, a, I got a question about downriggers and planers. Have you ever run a planer off of a downrigger and, and a release clip on the planer itself, which might allow you to use maybe a 30 wide instead of a 50 for a planer rod? Well, I use a I use a uh, I use a plain 30 for a planer rod because I got a braid on it. You know what I mean? Just put yeah, it. Yeah, I know exactly. So it releases now. I've done it. I've done it. With, I've, run it a, a, I've run a planer off of a, a downrigger. Yeah. And I've also run it off, just pleated it off. Right. You know what they call a poor man's downrigger? Right. Done it that way. It works. It just, works fine. Just a little more aggravating, maybe? A little bit. I just don't like something hanging down in the water that could possibly get around my propeller. Right. Or possibly that fish is going to get around. That's just one more thing so I've got to clear. The, the idea is just to get everything out of the water, out of your way. Mm -hmm. got it. Now, I'm not saying that you've got a fish on, you got to clear all your lines, you know, yeah. depending on what he's doing. Maybe just on that one side of the boat, yeah. But no. Uh, uh, I, I just prefer having the least amount of stuff down in that water i got to worry about. Yeah. Do they work? Absolutely. Been using them for years. They work fine. You leave them down all day and put like a shower curtain thing, let them slide down. Now they won't go all the way to the bottom. Yeah, that that was kind of the point of my question of, of using a release so that you do actually get it all the way down. I've heard that if you let it slide down, it doesn't get all the way. But if, if you if you snapped your line, your main line, uh, with the bait on it into that clip, then it would. Then it will absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you just had one cleat it off and leave it in the water all the time and just rubber band your line, yeah, your shower curtain or something, because you down. got that bow in that line, right. it's not going to get all the way down. Yeah, that's what I've heard. But, uh, yeah, it works. Okay. It works. It's just, like I said, there's a lot of ways to do it. This is just this is what I like. You know? yeah. And I have confidence in. 